Hey guys, are you taking the ACT soon and wondering how you can crush the math section and attack any hard questions that come your way? If so, we're gonna go over a couple really hard math questions. If you are prepping for this test, I highly recommend that you go and check out the best ACT prep course ever at supertutortv.com. We've helped students prepare for the ACT and improve their scores up to 12 points. We have students who have scored a 35 on the test and lots of very happy customers. So go check it out supertutortv.com. We also are working on an SAT prep course. If you're prepping for that course, sign up for our mailing list and we'll let you know when that drops very soon. supertutortv.com slash subscribe. And our ACT math books are really close to being done. We are working on the covers right now. So they will be to you guys before this holiday season. We have another video, if you haven't seen it, on the hardest ACT math problems. And in that video, I go over some hard problems, but I know we could only get through two problems and there are a lot more hard problems on the ACT math section. So in this video, I'm gonna cover two more. One is hard, not because it's actually hard, but just because a lot of you have never heard of that kind of a problem before. So it's what I would call a low hanging fruit, but in the hard category. So it's a great way to pick up extra points if you happen to get a question on the test and that's on standard deviation. We're gonna do that one first. And then we're going to do a polynomials problem that I think is actually one of the hardest ACT math problems I have ever seen in my life. So. We're gonna go over those two questions. Both of these have been sourced from the online practice ACT for international students. So we're gonna to go to question 50 first, so go there with me. And if you already know standard deviation and you go, oh my goodness, I took AP stats, skip ahead please. And I will see you in a few minutes for the rest of you. Let's get into standard deviation. The graph below illustrates the normal distribution curve. The percent of data that falls within each standard deviation from the mean is given to the nearest 0.1%. So you can see here, this is like a standard deviation curve. And this is how all of the data are distributed throughout this data set, right? Like 68.2% of the data are kind of in here, right? The next say 27 point something percent go out to standard deviations and so on and so forth, okay? Suppose that the heights of men in a certain population are normally distributed. That means they fall according to this curve with a mean of 69 inches. So the mean is always the middle right here. So that means 69 goes right here and a standard deviation of 2.7 inches. What that means is if 69 is right here, then 2.7 is one standard deviation up. So this line right here represents 69 plus 2.7 or 71.7, okay? To the nearest 0.1%, what percent of men in the population are at least 74.4 inches tall? So all we have to do is figure out how many standard deviations away is 74.4 inches tall from 69, and then add up our, our percents here. And this says at least, right? And then pay attention to our details so that we don't screw things up. So let's talk about how we do this. So you see here the 74.4 inches and I'm gonna write that down, 74.4 inches. And then we have 69 inches there. So I'm gonna subtract these two and figure out what the difference is. That's how I'm gonna start this off. And I get 5.4. Now I know my standard deviation is 2.7. Hmm, I'm pretty sure that's double that. Let's see, I'm just gonna double that. That's 14 and that's five. Yep, hey, that is double that. So guess what 5.4 is? This is two standard deviations. One standard deviation, two standard deviations. So we go up 2.7, 2.7. So here's what that means. That means we're at this bar right here when we get to this part of the population, right? So we have normally distributed with mean and we want to the nearest 0.1%, what percent of men are at least 74.4 inches tall? So to be at least 74.4 inches tall, you've gotta be here or above. So that means you can be 2.2 plus 0.1, okay? So that puts us at 2.3. Now mistakes people make, here are the mistakes people make. They forget to add the 0.1. Sometimes they just look at the thing that's at two standard deviations up and they don't add this little last piece. Sometimes they make a mistake of adding up everything kind of below. For example, maybe you add up the 50% here. This would be like 57, 47.7% would be this plus this. You can see those two numbers together. Half of this, I think it's 54. So these, you really don't know what's going on. But I can understand how some people would wanna put 2.2, but obviously 2.2 is not even here. They're actually being really nice to you by not putting 2.2 here. So this question is really not that hard, as you guys can see, but what it requires is that you kind of understand what standard deviation is. And what standard deviation is, 
is it's a measure of how far apart the data are spaced, right? So when our data are really close together, our standard deviation is going to be smaller, right? Because instead of adding 2.7 inches to the mean, I'm going to be adding a smaller number to the mean. And when our data are spaced out more, our standard deviation is going to be bigger. When we have a normal distribution, it falls along this curve and we just add for each standard deviation, that represents 2.7 inches. So when I do plus one SD, that means add 2.7 to this mean and then you get to where this line is. Hopefully that all makes sense to you guys. The other kind of problem that you're going to have to be responsible for doing when you have standard deviation are problems that might give you sets of data and ask you to say which one has the greatest standard deviation. For example, and I'm just saying this because I wanna orient you guys with standard deviation. That's my goal with this, going over this question, which is not actually that hard, like I said, but it's only hard because you guys like have never heard of it, for a lot of you at least. So for example, I might have two, three, four, five, six, and then I might have three, three, four, five, five, right? Now both of these have the same mean, but they don't have the same standard deviation. This one is going to have a greater standard deviation because the numbers are spaced farther apart. Do you see how the range is larger? And this one's going to have a tighter standard deviation because more of the data is clumped together. So that's how we measure standard deviation. It's how far apart is our data, not necessarily is it the same data. Again, a standard distribution is going to look like this, right? About two thirds of your material is gonna be in here. And then you've got most of it is going to be within two standard deviations. And then just at the fringes is going to be everything else. Cool, cool. So now we're gonna work on another problem. This problem is, again, one of the hardest problems I've ever seen on the ACT. It's a polynomials problem. And that is question number 54. So. We have a polynomial in X has M non-zero terms. Even just reading that and making sense of it is a little bit confusing. So let's just kind of make it real. What I mean by make it real is I'm gonna plug numbers into these to kind of show you what they mean. A polynomial in X has M non-zero terms. So a polynomial, whatever X is, right? X is maybe a set of stuff. I don't even know what this is. Has M non-zero terms. So let's just think about terms. Like terms are like if I have 2X squared plus X, okay? So each of these would be a non-zero term, okay? So I'm gonna let this be here. We're gonna let M equal two, and then this has M non-zero terms. But you see how I make it real? I write it out, I do the best I can. Another polynomial in X has N non-zero terms. So I'm gonna let N equal three, and let's make those where M is less than N. Okay, yeah, that is less than three. These polynomials are multiplied and all like terms are combined. The resulting polynomial has, in X, has a maximum of how many non-zero terms? So this whole in X stuff is literally just there to confuse me. In X means there's a set called X and it really doesn't even make that much sense. And so I'm going to ignore all this talk of X that's just there to confuse me. And I'm gonna focus on these polynomials that we have. We have this polynomial that has N terms and I need to come up with that. So I'm gonna call that, we could do like 2X squared plus X plus three, right? Or I could do something like X to the seventh plus X to the fifth plus X th to the third or something like that, okay? So there's like different things that it could be something like this, right? But my n equals three because there's one, two, three terms here. I have m equals two because there's two terms. The resulting polynomial in X has a maximum of how many non-zero terms. So let's talk about how do we maximize the number of terms? Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna FOIL these essentially and then we're gonna combine them. And I don't want terms to disappear. So here's what happens if I multiply these two together. Some of my terms are gonna disappear, right? Because if I rainbow these, right? If I had two X squared plus X, and then I had two X squared plus X plus three. And I rainbow multiply these. That means I do that and I get like four X to the fourth. I do that, I get two X cubed. I do that, I get six X squared. You see how I'm getting all these terms? I'm gonna add all those together. Now I'm gonna do the next round. X times two X squared is two X cubed. X times X is X squared. X times three is three X. So you see how some of my terms collapse here because these overlap. So I'd get like four X to the fourth plus four X cubed plus seven X squared plus three X, okay? So I went from two and three to four terms, right? And this is kind of a, I guess it's greater than two and three. So we have N, so I'm just gonna start going through these. The resulting polynomial has a maximum of how many non-zero terms? Well, N equals three and I just got one, two, three, four non-zero terms. Do you guys see that? So I know N is out. All right, now I have M plus N over two. 
that would be 5 over 2, which would be 2.5, which this is greater than 2.5, right? And I want the maximum, if you looked at the wording here, it says the maximum of how many non-zero terms. So just with my example here, when I took this first one that I came up with, you can see how I can kind of get rid of some of these. We have m plus n, that would be 5. Well, I got 4 here. I'm a maybe on that. I have m times n divided by 2, which would be 6 divided by 2, which is 3. 4 is still more than that. So this is out, and then I have m times n, which would be 6. So this would be 5, and that would be 6. So I'm down to C and E, just off of my one example, and I'm not even done yet, right? And now I'm going to think more about how do I really maximize the number of terms? Well, I maximize the number of terms by not having this stacking going on, right? I don't want these terms to collapse. I want each one to be individual and unique. So in order to do that, I'm going to pick really crazy numbers. So I'm going to pick things like these, like this x to the 7th, x to the 5th, and maybe I'll even make these wilder looking. We'll make this x to the 31st, like something really ugly. These are never going to overlap, right? 51. Okay, so we have x to the 7th plus x to the 51 plus x to the 31st times 2x squared plus x. Okay, so now I'm going to multiply these together and see what happens, right? And I get that times that is 2x to the 9th. Then I do that times that, I get 2x to the 53rd. You can see like nothing's collapsing here. And then we do that and I get plus 2x to the 33rd, okay? And then I'm gonna get these plus, and then we're gonna do this again. This is gonna be x to the 8th, x to the 50, x to the 52nd. And how I'm doing this, I'm just doing this times this, right? This times this, I'm just rainbow combining these by going that times that, that times that, that times that, right? And then I can change my color, we'll go that times that, that times that, that times that. So this is just a rainbow foiling, supposedly, but it's not foil because it's not first outer or inner last. It's like rainbow distribution, you could call that. X to the eighth, X to the 52nd, and then this is gonna be X times X to the 31st, which is X to the 31st, or X to the 32nd, I'm sorry. So you can see here, each one of these is unique. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six non-zero terms. So that's gonna be E, it's M times N because it's two times three, which is six. So our answer choice is E and we're done. Cool, cool. Now you may have been able to intuit a little bit earlier to get the maximum. You don't want things to collapse. So you could have started with this one instead of this one. And I think the first time I solved it, I probably did something like that or I started to get into it and I saw, oh, things are collapsing. Wait, I don't want things to collapse. And so I did this a little bit faster. But I'm showing you kind of all the steps so that you understand everything that goes into it and why this works and how it works and all that kind of good stuff. Obviously on this test, you don't have a lot of time. So this is the kind of problem that one, I would recommend skipping until you get to the end. And what's cool, it looks like even on the international test now, you can navigate down here so you can actually go back really easily to questions that you missed or that you guessed on. And our answer choice here is M times N. Cool, awesome. I hope you guys like this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and check out our best ACT prep course ever at supertutortv.com. It's a great way to prep for your ACT. I have tons more explanations. It's over 70 hours of video prep right now. So go check it out. Plug in on our social media. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. And we've got lots more videos to prep for the ACT for free here on YouTube. So if you're taking this test soon, go to our YouTube channel, check out our playlist of ACT videos and get to work. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much.